Greetings and salutations. Welcome to the Easy Linux Show version 18.7, recorded February the 2nd, 2018, Groundhog Day in the United States. I'm Joe Collins, and in this video, I hope to demystify the Linux file system hierarchy. I've gotten a lot of questions lately from folks who are new to Linux, and they don't quite know what they're looking at when they look at all those crazy directories that are in the file system. Also, another question that keeps coming up is, where do my programs go when I install them? And that is a very different way of doing things in Linux than it is in Windows. A lot of folks coming from Windows, they are just a little bit mystified. So we're going to demystify you. That's the uh, goal of this video. Before we jump into that, let me remind you that the Easy Linux Acer One Valentine's Day giveaway is in progress. It is open to folks in the continental U.S. And if you would like to be qualified to win when we have the random drawing coming up on Valentine's Day, you must include your full street address in the entry, okay? And it has to be one that you can receive parcels at. So... To do that, all you do is go to easylinux.com, go to the Contact Us page, and then look at the topics there and choose Acer One Giveaway. Type in your name and address. That's it. Send it on. And I will put your name in with everybody else's. I have had a ton of people that have already entered. And uh, one entry per person, please. Uh, entering several times will not help. I'm looking for that. I want everybody to have an even chance. <laughs> And uh, if uh, you win, I'm just going to ship this computer to you. It has Linux Mint pre-installed on it. All you'll have to do is boot it up and answer a few questions that will set up your user account for the machine, and you'll be off to the races. Everything else is pretty much pre-configured. So just create a user account and then update the system, and you're good to go. The machine itself is a 10-inch netbook. It has 2 gigabytes of RAM. It has a 32 gigabyte eMMC embedded SD card on the motherboard, and unfortunately, neither one of those is upgradable. But the machine actually does quite well with Linux Mint. It has a two-core Intel mobile processor in it. It has a USB 3 port, a USB 2 port, a headphone and a microphone jack, and then it has an HDMI output if you want to hook a monitor to it. It communicates with the world through Wi-Fi, so there's no Ethernet card in this machine. Uh, but it is surprising what you can do with it. You can watch YouTube videos, and you can do email, and you can learn Linux if you want to. And the reason why I'm giving it away is just to say thank you to everybody who has been so kind to the Easy Linux Project. We've had lots of subscribers, lots of folks liking us on Facebook, lots of great involvement in the community. So this is my way of showing you some love on Valentine's Day. So get that entry in, and maybe you'll win. Somebody's got to win. Might as well be you. All right, let's get down to the nitty gritty. We're going to talk about the Linux file system hierarchy. And I have kind of put together this little guide here, uh, notes for me, notes for you, as we roll through the video. And I listed a bunch of terms and put the definitions up here because uh, I think the first step to becoming really proficient with using computers is to understand the file system. You would not believe the number of people that I have worked with who are very good with working with programs, they've been using computers for years, and they don't have a single clue where anything goes, how anything is organized, what a file is, what a directory is. So I always tell folks, hey, if you really want to be a nerd, conquer that file system first. So let's run down this list of terms and and then we're going to kind of take a walk through the file system hierarchy in Linux. So these are in alphabetical order. So it'll all make sense when we get done running through them, all right? So the first one listed is directory, which is a special kind of file that contains links to other files. Keep that in mind. A file itself is a self-contained piece of information available to the operating system and any number of individual programs. Files are owned by the user who creates them in Unix and Linux. And that will become important when we get into uh, some of the attributes of files. 
file system. It can refer to the file system hierarchy, what this video is about today. That's the way files are organized and managed. Or it can also refer to the type of format that is used to store files on a block device like a hard drive. So you will hear people talk about file systems like ext4, xfs, fat32, and ntfs. These are two different things. Your file system hierarchy sits on top of the file system that is used to format the drive. And uh, so, you know, you can get real confused when you hear people talk about that. Uh, today, we're just going to talk about hierarchy. Most regular users don't even worry about what file system their disk is formatted to and how that works. It's, that is uh, real, you know, Linux nerd system management kind of stuff going on there. So uh, I've got plenty of videos up about that kind of stuff if you want to look at it. Folder is another name for a directory, especially when working in graphic environments. Uh, interchangeable with the term directory. And I do the same thing all the time. I will switch back and forth between folder and directory. So why are there two names for that? Well, years and years ago when we were all in computer science class and they were trying to teach us how file systems worked, uh, they would compare a hard drive or a tape drive or a floppy disk or whatever they had around, a cassette tape, whatever you were storing data on, to a big file cabinet. And each file or piece of information was like a piece of paper with typing on it or pictures or whatever. And in a filing cabinet, you can put paper in or you can group things together in logical ways and put them in manila folders. And then you can put manila folders within manila folders with files in them. It's the same thing with a file system. So when the graphic user environments came along, they represented directories with folders. We're so used to seeing that, we don't even think twice about it. And that's where that comes from, is that idea of comparing a directory, which is a file that contains links to other files, to folders. So, something to keep in mind as we roll along here. A link in Unix and Linux, it refers to two different things. There are symbolic links, and that is actually a file that points to another file. And you treat the link just as you would the file. And the reason why that is really cool is because this way you can have the same file appear in two places. And you treat the link like a file. When you click on it, it opens up the file, wherever that file might be. However, with symbolic links, if you delete the link, you don't delete the file. If you delete the file but don't delete the link, then you have a broken link. There is another way of doing that, and it's actually an older way of linking things, and it's called a hard link. A hard link is where you have one file, one block of information, but it actually has more than one name. And you can have many, many hard links to the same piece of information. And if you delete one of the names, like you would delete it out of one directory, but it appeared in other directories under a different name, the file doesn't actually go away, and this is used extensively in Linux, especially when dealing with the uh, system files uh, for lots of reasons. There's lots of hard links and symbolic links that are used. Average users, I eh, don't use it too much, but symbolic links certainly come in handy. Symbolic links um, have a little extra advantage in that they can link to directories, and they can also link across different devices, whereas a hard link can't do that. A hard link only works within the same file system. So when you have two devices, you'll actually have two different file systems on it, and it can't link across. It's uh, one of the few limitations to the way the Linux file system obfuscates the uh, devices that are on the system. We'll talk more about that uh, as we go on here talking about mount. Uh, that refers to the way devices are made to appear in a Unix or Linux file system. Partitions on hard drives, USB sticks, and CDs, and DVDs, and stuff like that are mounted in a directory somewhere within, a, within the, the file system of the computer. Now this is a foreign concept to a lot of folks who come from Windows because in Windows you're used to having your ABCs, that a drive is represented with a letter. 
Linux actually does represent the drives with letters just like Windows does, but we don't really concern ourselves with that. And the reason why is because Linux is super scalable. Linux can run on machines that have hundreds of users and lots of terminals hooked up to them like you'd find in corporations or uh, government or uh, you know educational institutions. It can be the master operating system for these really big machines or it can run on a little tiny device like a Raspberry Pi. It's super scalable and when you're running a big machine like that you may have many different storage devices hooked up to it. There might be all kinds of disk drives and tape drives and network storage hooked up to it, uh, all kinds of stuff. So it's nice to be able to just mount that somewhere within the file system and then you can gain access to it that way. And once you wrap your mind around this idea of mounting things in a file system, it makes a lot more logical sense because the average user doesn't really care where their data is living as long as they can get to it. And it makes it so if you're an admin, you can do all kinds of neat things. You have a hard drive that's running out of space, then all you got to do is pop another one in there and link it somewhere in the file system and suddenly you have a bunch of space uh, available to the system. But you didn't actually have to like reformat anything, change a bunch of links or anything like that. It's very, very cool like that. Uh, one of the main things to understand about the Linux file system is that users are considered to be somewhere within the file system whenever they're working with it. And to find your place in the file system, you follow a path. A path is, uh, it, it points to a file system location by following the directory tree hierarchy. Now we haven't gotten into trees yet. We're going to do that in a little bit. And what that means is when you when you have a file somewhere on the system, everything goes back to the root of the file system. And in Linux, that would be a, you know, just represented by a slash. That's the base of the file system. So if we want to find a file, an absolute path to it, and my example here would be slash home slash Joe documents slash letter to Cindy dot text okay that's how you get to that file that's where it is in the file system and it makes no difference how big the file system is or how many files are in it that way you can always find that particular file that is called an absolute path there's also something called a relative path and a relative path is how to get to a file from wherever you currently are in the file system and that would be like if you're when you log in you're automatically thrown into your home directory and so everything that's in that directory is yours so most of the time you will be concerned with uh, finding things within your own home directory if they're files that you create and those are called relative paths an absolute path would be how to get to it regardless of where you are currently located in the file system and you would give the full path in that case if you needed to do that. Everything in Linux is a file. Before we go uh, too much deeper into this, that's something else uh, that you need to understand. In Unix and Linux, even devices on the machine, your hard drive, your keyboard, your monitor, they are considered to be files. So all the system is really doing is moving data from one file to another. You take information from one file, you do something to it to change it, and then you store it in another file. And that is uh, one of the really cool concepts of working with Unix and Linux because from a programming point of view and getting the computer to do very complicated things with a bunch of simple tools it makes it super easy to do that um, so as you get more and uh, you know get more versed in how linux works you'll begin to appreciate the simplicity of that so the next thing i want to talk about is file permissions because they're very important and it trips a lot of people up i probably put too much information in my notes here so I'll probably skim over a lot of this stuff. I'm generalizing quite a bit as I do this anyway, so those of you who are already very versed in the Linux file system are probably sitting there going, you know, you didn't talk about that, you didn't talk, well, I'm not, because this is an introduction, and we're just moving through it very quickly. If, if there's something in here that you want to know more about, there's tons of information online, and you can just look up these different terms, and believe me, you can find enough information 
uh, that you can be reading for the next 10 years if you want to on all of this stuff. Linux is huge, and nobody really knows all of it. We all just sort of poke at it and try and get something out of it. So anyway, uh, the next thing we want to talk about is file permissions. Um, and file permissions do exist in other operating systems in Windows, but they're not strictly enforced. And in Linux, however, things are very much strictly enforced. And uh, the file permissions determine uh, who can access or change a file and whether a file can be executed as a program. Linux does not care what is in a file. It does not go by file extensions to know what things are. It's just a block of data. Extensions in Linux are for the convenience of the users and mainly graphic applications. But you'll notice that in Linux, a lot of times, there's no extension that says, oh, this is a program, or that this is this, or this is that. Because Linux itself, when you're dealing with basic file types, can figure it out for itself. So uh, the attributes of the file that tell you what kind of file it is and what the permissions are, uh, are stored in uh, a little block of data at the beginning of a file. So. As we cruise along here, let me go ahead and open up a terminal. I'm going to make this just a little bit bigger so everybody can see it. And what we're going to do is I'm going to list, and I'm going to use the long option, which will tell me everything about the files that I look at. And let's just do the work directory on my machine. This is sort of like my junk directory where I throw things that I'm working on. So there's a couple of files in here. And you'll see we have this list that pops up. And the first thing that you see the, the this bunch of data right here, we're going to get into that in just a second. The next number here that it shows us is the number of hard links to the file. In this case, there's only one because it's just a standard old regular file. Then it tells us what the who the file owner is. So the first column is the person who created it, the person who owns the file. In this case, it's me because it's in my home directory and it's my file. The next one is the group that the file belongs to. In Unix and Linux, we have the concept of user groups where uh, each user has his own group and then an administrator can create more groups and they can grant access to different users uh, in within these groups. Now, for a little desktop system that may only have one or two users on it, that's not something that you, you're thinking, well, what's the point of that? Uh, this comes from the fact that, once again, Linux is scalable. It could be on a very big corporate or government system, and you could have hundreds of people using this computer. So this is a way to get, uh, make, make it so the admin can uh, kind of divide those groups up. And let's say you had a group working on Project X. Well, he could create a group called Project X, and then the files that are created for that group would be owned by that group and other people wouldn't have the chance to read them, see them, modify them, steal them, stuff like that. Next we see the, file, the size of the file and by default it puts that in bytes. And then we have the last modification date of the file. That's the date and the time usually unless a file is really old and it'll just give the year. Um, and then the name of the file. So that's all the basic information that you can get from ls the list command about a file or list storage how whatever whatever you want to call that and so let's deep dive into that a little bit more so the first part of all that gobbledygook up front is what kind of file it is and there's actually more than i've listed here in the examples if it's just a regular file regular old data file then it's just represented by a, a dash there's nothing there if it's a directory for instance that would be a d and a link is an l you will see other things in there and that talks about you know special permissions that you can have on files special kinds of files that are created mainly by the system people who are just doing regular stuff usually don't run across those things. Now let's talk about the permissions. And the permissions are stored in groups of three. So we have three groups of three giving us nine total little permission fields here. The first group of three after the file type is for the user. The second group of three is for the group. And the third one is for other or the world. 
so the user has certain permissions, the group has certain permissions, and anybody else that might have access to the system would be considered the world. And so therefore the permissions can be set uh, for people like that, what they can do with a file if they can actually see it. And these are called octal values. That's how this is uh, figured out. We're going to, right here, this is the octal value of the permissions. And a file can be readable or not readable. It can be writable or not writable and executable or not executable. And yes, you can actually go into a terminal and you can set a file where nobody can do anything with it at all, including yourself. Uh, fortunately, the root user on the system, they have the ability to delete any files. <laughs> it doesn't matter what the permissions are. And uh, usually, uh, if you try, you can use the uh, force option to get rid of files uh, if you should happen to create one like that as well. But uh, the main thing to keep in mind is that in the octal system, we're talking about eight bits of information or one byte and it uses the digits zero through seven now I have explained that in past videos and I have said things like yeah I know it's only one through seven don't worry about it we're only worried about that it's still eight bytes and all that stuff and I think I confused some people because some people came out and went what are you talking about a byte is eight, eight, eight bits yes it is but we only use the numbers zero through seven so that's what I was referring to there. So that's why this is here. And I give you some um, idea of how you can use that octal system to change permissions here a little bit. So for instance, if we use the change mod command or change mode uh, to set a file to be executable and readable by everyone, but only writable by you, then we would use the change mode and then just set the permissions to 755 and the file name and yes there is another way to do that where you put a zero in front of that and that's for setting special bits that we referred to when we were talking about file types uh, most people who are just working with regular files don't need to worry about that so this format works just fine if you just want to set a file to be executable for for instance you can just use change mode and then plus x and the file name and that will do that path to the file not just the file name itself when you're dealing with directories, things get a little bit different because uh, when applying permissions to directories on Linux, the permission bits have different meanings than on regular files. The write bit allows the affected user to create, rename, or delete files within the directory and modify the directory's attributes. The read bit allows the affected user to list the files within the directory and the execute bit allows the affected user to enter the directory and access files and directories inside. Uh, most of the time we don't have to worry too much about setting permissions on directories but every now and again you might be trying to do something and, and you know, you're having a problem getting into a directory or a program says mm, I can't access it that's because those permissions might not be set quite right so it's something to uh, definitely get into and learn something about and then finally we got two little things here of uh, uh, the word root which we've been throwing around here uh, in this video thus far has two meanings in the Linux Unix word world uh, the first one is the root of the file system which is represented by a slash and that is where the file system begins and all other devices and everything else is hooked up into that file system all of all of the files uh, it can also refer to the a person who has administrator privileges on a machine we say that that person is a root user because they have total control over that machine and you may hear somebody say it's dangerous to run as root well it is because file permissions don't mean anything to root if you are running as a root user and you have root permissions set up all the time then you can do all kinds of crazy things like uh, you could accidentally try and save your uh, file that you're working on to your hard drive as a device I'm not talking about saving it to the drive I'm talking about the drive is treated as a device and if you send it to the wrong place you could wipe out your entire computer it can happen so that's why it's dangerous to run as root and that's why in Ubuntu and many other 
Linux distributions, the root user account is actually not enabled. We use sudo to act as root to get things done, and the first person that installs the system automatically gets those administrator privileges, but the root account itself is disabled. And that's for security purposes and to make things a little bit safer. And finally, a tree, that's a way to visualize a file system structure. So when you look at your tree here, uh, imagine it's a tree, but it's upside down, and then the different directories are branches. So you can have directories with files and more directories and files in there, and it goes on and on and on. There is actually a practical limit to how many directories you can have within directories and keep going that way, but it's way out there, and most of us will never get near to overloading that. So that is a look at the Linux file system and some of the terms that are involved. And what I want to do now is just sort of take a tour through the Linux file system for the rest of this video. So let's go ahead and clear this screen and then I'm going to list the root directory on this computer. And you see that this is what we come up with here. And what is all this stuff? And what does it mean? And what's in here? Well, let's take a, a, a look through, we'll just take a tour here with another graphic and uh, we'll just kind of talk about the basics. So I have this ready to rock and roll and I can zoom in on it. So the file system starts with the slash or root of the file system right here. There that is. And then we have all of these directories that are hooked up into the file system. So the first one we'll talk about is bin, which stands for binary. And a binary is an executable file. That could be a script or it could be a, a a blob of compiled code and what goes into the main bin folder or directory that is right off of root is usually system related stuff this is stuff that the system needs to run and it goes into bin the next one that you will pretty much always see no matter what Linux distribution you're on is boot and we can actually just take a look and see what's in these let's do that so first let's list bin and we'll take a look at what's in there and you'll see some commands that you're probably familiar with if you're playing around in a terminal. This is stuff that is necessary to run the system in here. So we have PWD, that's present working directory. There's your RM command, remove directory. We've got um, LS is here. This is where this lives. So a lot of real basic system commands go in there. So if we're going to kind of go through and list these, let's take a look at boot as well because that's the next one. This is where uh, all of the instructions for getting your computer booted up and uh, running are. This is also where the Linux kernel lives. You'll see a directory in here called grub. That's where your bootloader configuration files are. This is a very important directory to have on your system. <laughs> Believe me, you, you must have uh, the boot directory available or it ain't going to boot. That's what it's for. So the next one that we have is dev. And the dev directory is where all of your devices show up. And this is a real important directory. So let's list that and take a look at what we see in there. So, I mean, the first thing that jumps out at me is all this stuff that says TTY. Well, those are your terminals. So the kernel spins up a bunch of terminals to talk to programs and different users on the system. So that's a very important, they're treated as devices. Um, that would include keyboard input, that would include output to a screen, a display device, that sort of thing. So that's considered to be uh, a, a device that is represented as a file. Also, if you look over here, we scroll around a little bit. Let's see here. Uh, well, here's where your hard drives are. Your SDs are right here. So we have SDA1, SDA2, SDB, SDA, SDB1, SDB2. Um, so the way that works is, it's, you know, we have an A drive, and then the first partition would be SDA1. So you get the point. And this is just a whole bunch of different device files in here. And sometimes you can send things directly to a device. Like, we have a device in here called Null. Now, what that device is is the bit bucket. So if you're writing a program and you're going to be generating some random crap and you don't want to deal with it, you send it there. Everything in Linux is a file. What if you need a constant stream of zeros? Well, we have dev0 right there. And that is nothing but a virtual device that sends a stream of zeros. Pretty cool, huh? 
So the next directory to talk about would be etc. etc contains a bunch of configuration files uh, for your system. And then we have the home directory, which is really important. That is where all of your uh, user files go. And in your home directory, you can have different uh, account uh, directories in there for people who have accounts on the machine. So in this case, in this example, it's got Alice and Bob and and Eve. And also, uh, as of late, the home directory is used uh, for storage for backup programs. Uh, Timeshift and CYA both use the home directory to store snapshot style backups. So then we have a, a directory here called root and that is the home directory for the root user. So if you have a root account enabled on your machine and you log in as root, this is the root user's home directory. It's not put in the you know user land out there with the regular users. Root has his own and it's uh, kind of a little closer to the root of the file system. We're using root both ways there again. Haha. -ha. Anyway, uh, even if your root account is not activated, you still have certain uh, configuration files that go in there for programs that you run with sudo. That's where they will go is into root. Then we have the run directory. Run is where temporary file systems and information about the system that it needs while it's running is stored and uh, there's not much that stays in there permanently so that's just kind of a system directory. We have sbin, that's secure binaries. So in sbin what you're going to see is stuff that the system needs um, that uh, is mainly for the root user to use. You must have uh, root access to be able to get to the stuff that is in sbin but we can certainly take a look at it so let's do that and you'll see that we have a bunch of commands in here as well and now you'll see things like uh, well I see the makefs commands uh, that is how you format a drive from uh, working in a terminal there's all kinds of uh, really uh, you know system basic commands here they would be in sbin a bunch of stuff in there to take a look at the next on the list we have a temporary directory that's just exactly what it sounds like. It's just a place for the system and programs to store temporary files that they, it, it uh, creates. And then usually when the system reboots, the temporary directory is automatically cleaned out. USR, that is a very important directory, and that stands for Unix System Resources. Uh, some people just call it user, but it really doesn't have anything to do with users. This is where all of the binaries and configuration files and artwork and anything that you need to run programs that are not essential to keeping the system up and running lives. There is more stuff in your USR directory than any other directory on the system. So let's take a look in there. And you see we've got kind of a file system within a file system and we have there's bin and sbin and several other different things there and you see that sometimes these are linked so that is why the person who created this particular graphic has that link because sometimes you have uh, hard links that go from one directory to the next or, or uh, it's just things appear in two places uh, and it's done that way simply because of the fact uh, that uh, it just makes it easier for people who write programs and stuff like that. So uh, things can appear in two places here. You can have two different copies of stuff like that. So if you if you list it, you might see different stuff. Now, the one directory that is in sbin that is uh, <laughs> the probably the fullest is the bin directory under USR. That's what I'm trying to say. Hello. I hope I didn't confuse two people because I know I was saying some gibberish there. So let's take a look at uh, what is in that directory. We'll clear the screen. We'll ls usr bin. What I do wrong? I don't know. Oh, I typed it wrong. That's what the problem is. UST. Get that right. There we go. Now I'm just going to scroll through here. It already went down in the end. It just goes on and on and on and on. Lots of executables. 
of one kind or another here in this bin directory because there is where your entire desktop lives uh, pretty much uh, I'd say 98% of the software installed on your machine that's where it is it's in there and then we have uh, var this particular directory is where variable stuff goes this would be logs uh, if you uh, have system mail set up on your system where you can email back and forth from one user to the other I know that that's something that you don't really use on a regular desktop but it is available in Linux you can set that up uh, stuff about printers any kind of variable information it goes in here there's a there's a ton of stuff that is in var and uh, that's pretty much all we've got to look at on this so what I'm gonna do is go back and we'll talk about some of the other directories that you'll find in the system Let me clear that up and we'll just list this again so we can kind of talk about the different directories that you see so uh, here you'll see lib32 and lib64 and you did see that in uh, the uh, USR directory we had lib as well when I listed that that's for libraries different programs that run on your system use libraries to uh, get all kinds of information and uh, their resources for programs a best way to explain what a library is is you could have a library called cards dot lib okay let's say that that's the name of it and it is all of the graphic information necessary for a deck of regular standard playing cards so you could have three or four different programs written by different people that all depend on that particular library and their card games for instance and that's what they need to to actually load the cards up into the game so that's the best way to describe what a library is let's see what else do we have in here the media directory we didn't talk about that media is where removable devices are mounted when you plug them in and you're running a desktop so if you're running like a regular Linux desktop and you plug your USB stick in and it gives you some sort of message or little icon pops up on the screen that's where it's mounted it goes into media under your username assuming that you have access to it we have the proc directory or PROC process directory that is where processes that are currently running on your system that's where you can find them so remember in Linux everything is a file so when a program starts doing something and starts communicating back and forth with the kernel and the processor that's done through a process which is represented by a file so you can look at processes directly in that uh, particular uh, directory uh, let's see we have the MNT directory MNT is short for mount and that is for programs and users to temporarily mount things we have the CD-ROM directory which is still shipped in Linux Mint I, I don't know whether Ubuntu still ships that or not but it, back in the old days when you had to manually mount up a CD when you put it in the machine that's where it would go so it's here now for backward compatibility in case you have an old program that might be looking for that um, let's see and we've already talked about lib lost and found that is a directory that is uh, reserved for the file system and uh, when the machine boots up it checks to see if the disk is healthy and if it needs to throw any like uh, orphaned files or something like that if there was a problem with the file system on the disk now we're talking about the file system on the disk and not the file system hierarchy here uh, then it will throw the bits and pieces in there and throw them into lost and found and uh, sometimes you can go in there and look at them and you know recover some data out of there very rarely but it does happen then we have the opt directory the opt directory is curious because what it does is it uh, um, it's where some software is installed on the system so in in my case I have Google Chrome Ocean Audio and Team Viewer those are all proprietary programs that run on Linux so usually self-contained proprietary programs like that that's where they'll go users have access to opt and they can put compiled programs in there as well if you want to and then we have the sys directory uh, which is like as it implies it's where more system type stuff goes in 
Uh, we have the SRV directory. That's if you're running any servers on your system. That's where that stuff information goes. Uh, usually regular users don't mess around too much in there unless they have a, a really good reason. And I think that pretty much covers it. Uh, that is what is in your file system. Now, before we wrap up the video, I'm going to answer the question, where do my programs go when I install them? Because people ask me all the time, can I install programs on my USB stick or external drive? Can I redirect it to install somewhere else? In Linux, no, you can't. I mean, you could, but it would require you doing symbolic links and all kinds of hoodoo voodoo to make that happen. Linux is very particular about where programs are installed. And to give you some idea of how many different places programs can be installed, let me just do this. I'm going to echo, and I'm going to look at the path variable for my system. This is my path variable. And you're going to see this is a whole long list of different paths that are separated by colons. And this is where the, pro the system looks when you type in a command or you try and start a program. So you can have stuff, uh, you can have scripts and programs that are in your uh, bin folder in your home folder. That's the first place it looks. That would be things that you've created yourself, scripts, aliases, uh, things that you've compiled if you're somebody who does that sort of work. The next place that it looks would be in uh, your home folder once again, but now it's looking in .local. That's another place that you can put stuff like that. And then the next place it's going to look is usr slash local slash uh, sbin. That's secure binaries in usr. And then usr local bin. That is where you put uh, stuff that is uh, not managed by the package manager on the system. So if you write your own program and you compile your own or you compile, compile your own program or scripts or whatever, you can put it in there and it gives access to that program to everybody on the system whereas things that are in your own home directory uh, which is like the first you know couple of entries in the path there things that are in your home directory you're the only person that's going to have access to them not even the root user has direct access to those unless you give it a full path so uh, it looks in uh, sbin let's see it just keeps on going on you see that there's all of these different places and then like the last place it looks is, you know, like the bin folder. And that's where all the system stuff is. And uh, then it looks in games, USR slash games, USR slash local games. I guess that's where games go. Uh, so when you install a program, the developer who creates the program pretty much decides where it goes. And it is installed in one of these locations on the system. You can't move that. Linux programs are not usually in self-contained files. They depend on other programs and libraries like we talked about earlier. And so the location of the program is very important. And, uh, you know, every now and again, you will come across things where the program actually lives over here, but there's a link. And we talked about that as well. And it's really best to let the developers deal with that or to follow the instructions of a developer or somebody who's found a workaround. Sometimes you have to change a link to get something to work if you're trying to get something kind of weird to work. And that's where it goes. Okay, I think I have rambled on enough. And I certainly hope that that helps a lot. I have generalized quite a bit. I'm, you know, it's very complex. There's a lot to talk about. I hope that, uh, you know, I've been clear and concise about this sort of thing. Uh, look at you know read look it up it's all over the place you can you can you could like look up individual directories and it'll it'll tell you what's supposed to be in there and how it's supposed to work because we've really only skimmed over the top there are thousands and thousands and thousands of files in your Linux system feel free to poke around feel free to look in the system that's one of the beautiful things about Linux is that uh, nothing is hidden from you so you can look at things and uh, you, you have total access to it at all times. And, uh, you know, other operating systems that I shall not name don't necessarily have that option available to you. And so they hide things on purpose. Linux hides nothing from you because it is open source and you have access to everything. And you can't break anything just by looking around. 
uh, you know, it's the system is not going to let you delete things that you're not supposed to unless you try and do it as root. Uh, so feel free to click around, read. There's all kinds of documentation tucked in to all kinds of different places. Uh, take a look around. It's all here. So thank you for watching the video. I certainly do appreciate it. Be sure and check out Easy Linux on the web. Check out Easy Linux on Facebook and check out freedompenguin.com for lots of really cool stories and tutorials and videos about Linux that appear on that page from contributors such as myself. We'll do it again soon. Thanks for watching.